Welcome to the Endless Knot podcast, where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. Today's podcast is really just Mark and me having a conversation. One of the ideas that we had originally when we thought of doing this podcast is we wanted to kind of replicate the uh, over the dinner table conversations that we often have. Yeah, we have a lot of rambling conversations because there's a lot of things that occur to us when we're chatting. And telling each other about the weird things that we discovered that day and... Capping each other's stories. So what we thought we'd do was have some of the podcast episodes just be basically us talking about the things that we've been finding out and topics that are of interest to us right now. And in order to make it more like our relaxed dinner time conversations, we're having a cocktail while we do it. Indeed. After all, that's also part of our normal routine. <laughs> a nice cocktail before dinner. Mm -hmm. And part of the videos. Yeah, some of the videos are about cocktails. They're definitely something that's been important in our lives, actually. So today we're having a Horfrost cocktail. This is something neither of us has had before. We'll get to why we've chosen that one for today a little later when we get onto one of the later topics we lined up to talk about. Cheers. We can't Cheers. clink because they're sugar coated. I'll put a link to the cocktail recipe in the show notes and a picture, and you'll see that the rim is coated in sugar, and so for it makes a very unpretty thump. When we we tried to clink them, it didn't work. But cheers. Cheers. Mm. It's a very sweet cocktail, but that's not surprising. Mm hmm. The reason we chose it is one of its main ingredients is grenadine. And as I said, I'll explain why that's important later. All right, so we want to start with some follow-up. I know we've only had... Uh, we've only, at this point, when we're recording this, we've only released two episodes and recorded three. This is the fourth episode that we're recording. And yet we already have follow-up on, <laughs> on our own podcast. We yeah. already have some things we wanted to talk about that now we, we should, didn't... should say, though, that this may also be going up third. Yeah, we don't know when exactly we know what we're going to put this up. You as the audience know, but we're certainly only responding to follow up from things we've already posted. Yes. That much is true. The first thing we wanted to talk about was to go back over some of the stuff about memory, right? That was right. our idea. So, And there were some recent articles that have been floating around in yeah. social media that we wanted to pick up on. Yeah, before we get to that, I just wanted to make a point about something that I linked to in the show notes from the Detective Story episode. Right. But that I didn't actually talk about in detail in that episode. So in the detective story, we talked about how there were people all the way through the medieval period in the ancient world who complained that when you learn to read, you forgot things. It was detrimental to your memory to learn to read. And we neither of us actually gave an exact citation for that. So I went and looked it up afterwards because I was curious. What I found that is sort of the most often quoted on this topic is Socrates in the Phaedrus, which is a dialogue by Plato. So I put a link to that on the last one. I'll put a link again in the show notes for this episode. So Plato writes a dialogue called the Phaedrus in which Socrates tells a story, a myth near the end of the dialogue in which he says, I heard a story about Egypt. He says that in Egypt, there was a god named Toith, I guess, who invented writing, and he brought this invention to show to another god, who said, well, you think you've come up with something that's really beneficial for humans, but really, this has not helped humans, it's been a problem for humans. For this invention will produce forgetfulness in the minds of those who learn to use it, because they will not practice their memory. Their trust in writing, produced by external characters which are no part of themselves, will discourage the use of their own memory within them. You have invented an elixir not of memory, but of reminding, and you offer your pupils the appearance of wisdom, not true wisdom. All right, this is often cited all over the place as uh, Socrates disapproved of writing because writing led to the lack of memory. I think it's really interesting because it, this is one of these examples of quotes being taken out of their context, right? Which we are both very well aware of. This is the sort of thing people love to do with the ancient world and the medieval world. Right. Which is take a little quote, forget about the context, forget about the genre, forget about anything else, and just use it to prove so-and-so thought such and such. Right. So the thing is, I just want to give one moment to talking about Plato and the Phaedrus. So Socrates is not the author of this text. He is the author of no text. Right. A very key point here. 
Socrates wrote nothing down. He's famous for never having written anything down. Plato wrote the Phaedrus, right? Right. So Plato wrote a dialogue, specifically a form, a new form, which was a recording of dialogue. So it was a recording of conversation. And he wrote all these dialogues and in them Socrates features. So in this dialogue that Plato wrote, Socrates features he is talking to someone else and he is telling a story about another dialogue that happened in which somebody said that writing leads to forgetfulness. But of course, that conversation, which is layered several times then, was written down by Plato. So Plato is telling, is writing down the conversation that Socrates had about another conversation which said that writing things down makes you forget stuff and gives you only the appearance of wisdom, not true wisdom. But of course, Phaedrus, the person he's spoke, speaking to, has been the whole context of this speech, and that's the important thing. The context of the dialogue is Phaedrus came to him with this really great speech made by a speechwriter. And he's like, oh, it's such a wonderful speech, isn't it great? And he recites it, and then Socrates says, oh, it's good, but makes up another one. It's a big, long, you know, philosophical dialogue with a lot of points to it. The thing about it is, when Socrates says writing is bad because all it does is remind you, that's really interesting to have that in a dialogue that is writing down to remind us of the things Socrates said. So it's these levels and levels of undercutting. If Socrates thought writing was bad, why did Plato write all his dialogues down? Yeah, I suppose there's two possible things going on there. One, Plato could be accurately reporting something that Socrates said mm -hmm. and is knowingly writing it down with some irony or for some purpose. Mm -hmm. And of course, Socratic irony, the main way in which Socrates teaches is by saying things and it is a method of irony. It's a specific type. Socratic irony is a particular kind of irony where you say something that seems to be false, but then you prove it's true or vice versa. And where you sort of play with the expectations of truth in your audience. So that could be part of it. The other possibility is that Plato could be misrepresenting Socrates mm -hmm. and just using Socrates as a puppet. Yeah, as a, ironically, mouthpiece as a mouthpiece. for a, a certain mm -hmm. kind of language. Yes. And the funny thing is, too, that a lot of the, the larger quest of Socrates is for truth and wisdom, right? It's all about wisdom. All of this, the dialogues are about right. finding wisdom somehow. And the whole Socratic method is based on the idea that somehow we all know the Platonic ideals. We know the truth of the world, but we've forgotten it. We don't mm -hmm. remember it. We can't, and we have to be led to it by the Socratic method of conversation, asking questions. You ask questions, you prompt people to think more deeply until they remember the truth of things. Right. While saying that memory, that writing doesn't increase memory, it incre it's a method of reminding people. Well, that's what the Socratic method does. It reminds people of things they supposedly already know. So then maybe Plato is saying, in fact, writing is exactly that. It is a reminder of wisdom. It isn't, the writing is not the wisdom, but the writing allows you to remember and be led to true wisdom. Right. Just the same way that Socrates' dialogues right. led people to remember their wisdom. So these dialogues are not wisdom, but reading these dialogues allows you to work your way through. It's a virtual conversation. Yeah, it allows you to participate in the conversation in such a way that you end up re recovering your memory of, of wisdom. Now, I am not a philosopher. I do not study philosophy. I find Plato kind of fascinating from his narrative technique, but otherwise, I'm really not good at it. So out there somewhere, there is somebody who studies Plato and has studied this dialogue who is thinking, what? You are crazy. You are not understanding this at all correctly. So, sorry. Now, Plato wasn't the only student of Socrates who wrote stuff down. No, Xenophon did as well. Mm -hmm. So, to what extent do they coincide in, oh, in terms of their characterization of Socrates that's a and his huge, ideas? That's a huge field that I'm really not a specialist in, but there's a huge field. Well, even in Plato, the Socrates of the early dialogues and the Socrates of the later dialogues is quite different, right. and there's co internal contradictions, and there seems to be some sort of general theory that at the beginning, there's most of the dialogues are actually replication of things that happened, at least in part. 
but by the end, Socrates is just a mouthpiece for Plato's own developed thought. When, when Plato it, develops his own mm-hmm, because ideas, the, then... All of the dialogues, I think, I think all of the dialogues are written after Socrates' death. Right. And they're written over a long period of time. So by the last ones, they're long after he died. I might be getting that quite wrong, but it's, it's pretty close to correct. And then Xenophon writes quite different characterizations of Socrates, too. Yeah, so there's a whole... But I just think it's really interesting, because we were, we were talking about writing and memory, that here we have a quote about writing and memory that is used by people in a way that is not really very cognizant of its context. So it's taken out... So people are remembering that Socrates didn't like writing. But they don't really have any understanding of the larger context, which may, which calls a lot of that into question. And that's, I don't know, it just seems like a very appropriate for a quote about memory to have problems because people are forgetting about the context. Right. <laughs> that, that it was in and that therefore makes it difficult to interpret. So I just wanted to bring that up. I'm still looking for medieval sources for the idea that writing leads to forgetfulness, uh, that people shouldn't learn to read. No. Uh, because I don't know of any, but I feel like there are some. I I think, and I haven't searched it out yet, but I think, because I can't go more than an episode without mentioning James Burke, I think he gets <laughs> into this in, not connections, but The Day the Universe Changed. Okay. Um, and I believe it's in episode four, A Matter of Fact. All right. Um, so either in there or in the uh, in the book based on uh, that, the series, right. um, there may be a reference to a, a specifically medieval repetition Re- of that idea. Right, where somebody says that writing or reading is yeah. problematic for... Okay. But if, if anyone uh, listening to this knows of a specific yeah. reference... Let us know on Twitter, because I'm totally interested in following that up. I don't know what I'll do with it, but I think it's an interesting idea. And this gives us an opportunity for coming back to this topic again yes. in another follow-up. Yeah, uh, I want to revisit these topics in as many layered ways. I, too, want to be Plato writing, uh, talking about a dialogue that we had about a dialogue that we had about a dialogue that we had. (laughs) That appeals to me. All right, so that was one point I wanted to bring up. And then tying into that, we talked about how really the whole point there was that new technologies affect the way our brains work. Right. And then that was where you said that as you said, there've been some articles about that going around. Yeah, specifically what's what's often referred to as the Google effect on memory. Mm-hmm. And we'll, we'll put links to the uh, popular Some... article summaries and the original research mm-hmm. um, if you're just interested in tracking all of that down. But the, uh, the sort of summary of it is that if you think you will be able to have access to information online... Or on a computer. Or on a computer... Mm-hmm on a computer at a at some point in the future, you will be less likely to remember the information itself, but you will have an enhanced memory of how to find that information again. Right. So what you do is when, and I think that the study was basically that people were primed to think about computers. Yeah. They weren't told you will have access, but they were given priming that made them think about computers. And then they were given information to remember. And the findings were that people who had been primed to think about computers were worse at remembering that actual information, but were better at remembering where to find it, which, you know, that's what we were talking about last time. That's not necessarily bad. I mean, we have a lot of memory. We have a lot of things to remember. And does it actually make sense for us to try to remember all those things? If you can remember where you found it, then why bother remembering the thing at all? As long as you can find it again. Yeah. And, and I mean, yes, the, it requires the persistence of access to that information. So yeah. then if you don't have access to that computer or whatever, that information is no longer available. Yeah. So there can be flaws to it. So, so there can be yeah. flaws to it. But if you, obviously, if you do you know, buy into the argument that writing makes us remember things less and, mm-hmm. you know. There, there are flaws to that too. Flaws to that too. You don't too. have the book available, you don't have that memory. Yeah. But the the benefits outweigh the cost mm-hmm. is the point. Mm-hmm. And and this this idea about the, the Google effect and so forth comes out of larger research on what's sometimes referred to as transactive memory. So it's distributed memory systems. Mm-hmm. It was originally noted noticed before the internet and all of that right. comes into the into the picture that you can have distributed memory systems in groups sort of like what might be popularly referred to as groupthink or something like that the the sort of interconnected memories of people people for instance in an organization may have 
a specialty in a certain area. So you rely on them right. to know that thing. You don't have to know it. We talk about that as institutional memory. Institutional often memory. when we talk in academics, mm -hmm. that's comes up all the time. You know, one person, one member of the department retires and suddenly nobody knows how to file course change forms anymore because it was always that person who told you how to do it. Right. Because we, not everybody bothers to remember it. One person is sort of in charge of remembering it, even if you never make it explicit. Now, there is also a sort of collaborative inhibition effect that sometimes produces worse results. It depends on the relationship between the people that are interacting. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, they did a, a study with pilot and co-pilot, and because they're so practiced at... They know whose task yeah, is, it is to, to have... That which... the benefit outweighs the potential cost. Right. And the other, the other example of this is with married couples. Yes, you pointed me to, this, to the article that talked about that, that... People can actually remember certain kinds of, certain kinds, not all, but certain kinds of memories better if, as a couple, they talk about it together because they prompt each other and they fill in each other's details and mm -hmm. they do a better job yeah. of recalling particular kinds of memories than others. I've also seen that talked about in another context where, much like we, you know, one splits up housework according to jobs, right. you'll split up one member of the couple will be the person who's really in charge of remembering birthdays. And yes, the other person yeah, doesn't yeah. ever do that, not because they can't, but because that's just not their job. Mm -hmm. And while another person will be really good at remembering what needs to be bought at the grocery store. And I mean, to a certain extent, that's just really task division. But I think it kind of functions the same way. And you see that when two people divorce or one of, of a long-term couple dies, mm -hmm. the other person only has half their yeah. memories left. Yeah. <laughs> they really are functionally cut off from a lot of their important memories. The interesting thing, though, is it's not just a question of the aggregate memory. The, the researchers on this talk about emergence, so that the sort of result is an emergent memory system that is more than the sum of the two individuals. So it's not just that well, I keep half of the memories, you keep, you keep the, other the other half, half. of the memories. Yeah, it's, it's not the... just distributing the cognitive load. It's a question of the way that they cue each other off can produce more information than either one could have individually added together. So now we get back to the Socrates idea that what you're doing is reminding the other person of memories yeah. they actually have but are not accessing. Exactly. Because if, if my remembering a detail about our wedding day reminds you of another detail that I don't remember, that you didn't remember until I had cued you, then that memory was in you. You had that memory. You were actually the one storing that memory. I wasn't storing it. Right. But my ability to cue you is what allows you to access that memory. So it's as if we're doing better file routing or something rather than necessarily storing each other's memories. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's yeah, so it's it's an emergent property. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's one of these one plus one equals three it's type Socratic. things. It's Socratic. It's Socratic method. <laughs> <laughs> so when you want to remember something, you just have to dialogue about it. But yeah, I think that article said it really depended on the relationship too. Because if what you do, if in trying to recall a memory, one of you simply critiques the other person's yeah. memory. No, that wasn't right. He was not there. I tell you, he wasn't there that that actually mm -hmm. uh, has a negative effect on your ability to remember things. And so they tracked the sort mm -hmm. of closeness and quality of the relationship, of and that relationship, was apparently yeah. uh, an important factor. Yeah, I thought that was very interesting. All right. I think that's everything. Oh, oh, I know. There was one other element in that article about the Zygarnik effect. So I'll point to that. It's in Scientific American blog. And there the idea was that you're better at remembering things when you're in the process of doing them than you are once the process has completed. And therefore, if you allow a process to continue by never finalizing it, you'll do better for some reason or another. You'll do better at remembering it. And this, the example that was given was uh, waiters. They'll take an order and they'll remember it perfectly. But the minute the order is fulfilled, they it's forget worked. it. It's yeah. complete. They cannot recreate it. That's not true of all waiters, but this was an effect that was noticed. And the thing that's interesting about that is that writing things down seems to have an effect on your brain that says this is now completed. This is now a completed action and you stop remembering it mm -hmm. or thinking about it. And so this was in reference in particular to the idea of writing and creativity. Yeah. That if you write something down, you can't, it's, it's done. Your brain says, oh, I don't need that information anymore and wipes it. And then in create when reference to creativity, what that means is if you I guess lose the, the work, if you lose the work, you can't, you can't recreate it, recreated yeah. it because the act of, of creating it is over and your brain just won't do it again. Yeah. The article gives the example of Hemingway. Yeah. Famously lost, happened. lost a suitcase mm -hmm. full of work, but also of various writers who said things like don't make notes about a story you're going to write 
write a first draft. Once you've written the notes, you'll you never be able that. to recall mm -hmm. that moment of creativity that you had going into it. <laughs> what we thought was interesting about that. So we've been doing a little research on our follow-up and pointing each other to these articles, but we've been being really careful not to discuss them until the mics were on. Because we can't have the same discussion again. Yeah, because you can't recreate it. We want it to be natural. And I mean, that's exactly this idea that once we've written it down or shared it with one another, our brains are not going to want to do that again and are going to discard that interesting thought that mm -hmm. we had. It's not quite exactly the same thing, but I think it's definitely related. <laughs> by the way, I wanted to point out that article uh, that we're both talking about here was written by Maria Konnikova, who wrote that book that I've talked to you before about uh, Mastermind, which uh, oh, yeah, okay. it, it uses Sherlock Holmes mm -hmm. uh, as an example of ways of thinking. Right, right. I didn't realize that. Mm -hmm. I didn't look at the article's author. I apologize. That was very bad of me. So yeah, we'll give a link to that. Okay, so does that cover the follow-up? By the way, by speaking about follow-up, we are shamelessly stealing from Hello Internet, which is a podcast that we both like very much with CGP Grey and Brady. I'm sure others use it too, but... Yeah, but there's no question that we are using their mm -hmm. application of it. Though I don't think we have yet got... We, we'll see. We're only on our third podcast. We'll see if we can have an episode where the follow-up massively actual. eclipses right. the actual new business, as it were. All right, but I do think that's everything that we wanted to get back to. So there were a couple of other things that came up. The main thing and the reason we're drinking Horfrost cocktails that we wanted to talk about that's been in the news is... The recent flyby of Pluto. Mm -hmm. So for us, we're recording this about a week after... Maybe a little longer than that now. Yeah, a week, a, and a, week, a week and a half after. Yeah, the... about a week and a half after. Mm -hmm. So this probably won't go up until a while later, but that's okay because there'll be pictures from Pluto coming in for a while. So you'll all still be excited about it, right? <laughs> yeah, we were thinking about Pluto and all the wonderful pictures coming in and the new information we have about it. And so we thought we'd talk a little bit about specifically... The name Pluto and, and other mm -hmm. names. Because we care about names, names and words and, and etymologies and, and myth. mythology and... Mm -hmm. So I just thought we'd, we'd look at a couple of things. Maybe the first thing to say is why we're drinking Horfrost cocktails. <laughs> right. The prime ingredient Or in the important ingredient, the one we were looking at, yeah. Is, is grenadine. Mm -hmm. And grenadine is, of course, made historically, and in the case of the one we have, from pomegranates. And pomegranates are relevant to Pluto because of Persephone. And then, of course, this is the Horfrost, which is relevant to Persephone as well because it signifies winter. And... Now, I, I referenced this story in a video, and we will we won't get into that video today, mm -hmm. but uh, oh, we'll put a link to it. So this um, is a story of narrative. And we'll, in, and we'll, get to, we'll get to that one in a future podcast, but... The basic thing is it's the story of Persephone, or Proserpina, who is abducted by Pluto, the god of the underworld, brought to the underworld. Her mother gets so upset that she's lost. Her mother is Demeter, who's the goddess of the grain, that she causes a massive drought over the whole earth, so there's nothing grows. Finally, Persephone is allowed to return only if she's eaten nothing in the underworld, but unfortunately she's eaten six pomegranate seeds. And by doing so, she's doomed herself to spend half the year in the underworld as the queen of the dead, and half the year in the overworld with her mother Demeter, as one of the twin goddesses of fertility. And then this is used as an explanation for the seasons. So when she's in the underworld, it's the winter, and when she comes out, it's the summer. And that's why we thought hoarfrost and grenadine was an appropriate nod called that. to that story. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's what Pluto is named after. So let's, yeah, let's start with the discovery of Pluto itself. All right. This comes out, uh, so in the, in the 19th century, before they discovered Neptune, mm -hmm. they predicted its existence on the basis of its gravitational effect on Uranus. Right. They were able to see that there was something that was mm -hmm. perturbing the orbits, yeah. Due to their observation then of the orbit of Neptune... Once it was discovered. Once it was discovered. They knew that there had to be something else. They believed that there had to be something else affecting its orbit. Now, as it turned out, as it turns out, they were wrong. Mm. Um, they they the just had a, a... They had they just didn't have an accurate estimation of its mass. Oh, okay. So, in fact, you don't need another planet beyond it to be affecting its orbit. Be Which is one of the reasons Pluto is not a planet, because it's not actually it's big enough to be affecting It's too small to have much Neptune, of an effect, right? yeah. 
So they were wrong about this, and it, it was what was called the Planet X hypothesis right. at the time. But at the time, they believed, oh, there's got to be a Planet X to make sense of mm -hmm. our observations. So they started searching. And in particular, the person who started really pushing for the, its discovery is the wealthy scientist Percival Lowell. Okay. Right? So he was, he was independently wealthy, and he poured a lot of his personal finance into astronomy, mm -hmm. his, his big interest, including establishing what is called now the, the Lowell Observatory. Right. And as it turns out, they, they did actually, within his lifetime, I believe, take pictures of what later turned out to be Pluto. They didn't realize it at the time. Okay. So he died before they actually formally found it. Right. But he was really interested. Mm -hmm. By the way, the other reason that, that Lowell is a famous figure to most people is he's, he's the uh, Martian Canal guy. Oh, right. Who thought that there was, right. Yeah. Who described them, okay. But in terms of Pluto, he was really interested in this whole Planet X thing. And so here's when we get where we get into a little bit of an, an extra wrinkle into, in terms of the mythology. Mm -hmm. Now, Pluto is not only the god of the underworld, mm -hmm. he's also associated with... Wealth. Wealth. Mm -hmm. Appropriate when, uh, when you consider that Lowell, Lowell was a was rich, wealthy, so rich, wealthy guy okay. pouring his money into this thing. But when he died, there was a bit of a legal battle over his estate, okay. over where his money, uh, he wanted it to go, or some money to go to continuing to fund the observatory. Mm -hmm. His widow, however, fought a legal battle to hold on to the money for herself. Mm -hmm. So I guess greed comes into play here. Mm -hmm. Though interestingly, she she seems to have been quite an interesting person. And it, it suggested that he was originally in love with someone else and his family didn't approve his, you know, he, yeah. he came from this sort of upper class Harvard family, I believe. So when he married her, people have questioned, you know, what is the quality of their relationship? Mm -hmm. And that might have been played Part into what was going on, after, what he was going on yeah. after he died. Nevertheless, she was very insistent that when Planet X was discovered, she wanted it to be named after him, to be ah, named okay. either Percival or, or Lowell. Lowell. Which it would have really broken with the naming conventions yeah. of the planets. Though, as it turns out, it probably was an influence in terms of what name they picked because his initials, PL, right. Pluto, What's and the astronomical symbol for Pluto is PL. Okay. So it did have a bearing on that. But where the name came from, actually, is an 11-year-old girl. Yeah. Her name is Venetia Burney. Mm-hmm. The daughter of uh, Reverend Charles Fox Burney, who was a professor of Holy Scripture at Oxford. More importantly, she was the granddaughter of, and this is one of the best names ever, ever Falconer Madden. Ah, of course. Good old Falconer <laughs> Madden. Madden. <laughs> who was a very important scholar in his own right. So Falconer Madden... By the way, when we have these dinnertime conversations, we don't normally have notes. So they're not quite as well referenced as this. <laughs> Falconer, Falconer Madden was the librarian of the Bodleian Library at Oxford. Okay. And he told his granddaughter about this discovery, uh -huh. and he was talking about it with her, and, and she suggested the idea, which he then passed on. Okay. So it came from her, but it wasn't... came from her, yeah. but she, he, he sort of delivered the what suggestion. What was his connection to the person who discovered it? Or why did he get to decide to suggest it? I think he just, as, as a noted scholar... You know, had had scholarly connections, and he just passed it on. Yeah, um, I'm not sure if there was any more specific connection than that. Okay. But the other interesting thing is Madden was, just in, in relation to some of our other lexicographical interests, mm -hmm. involved in the revision of the Little and Scott Greek English lexicon. Oh, okay. In in as a sort of librarian, so I think he. I'm not Helps exactly sure what he did, but he yeah. yeah he gathered the the text, the collections that were used in in the revision of that, and he was also a noted scholar on Lewis Carroll. Oh, okay. So he was involved in the revision of a biography of Carroll, and he, I believe he edited some collection of scholarship or something like that. All right, so that's where the name suggestion came from. And I guess it was probably considered appropriate, as you say, because of the PL and because of, you know, it was a planet that the, was invisible to us. I wonder how much that actually had to do with it, because Pluto is another name for Hades. The name Hades means invisible, the invisible yeah. one. Well, that was it, that I think was Venetia Burney's reason, reason for suggestion for yeah. suggesting what it. What a clever that, little girl. Yes. <laughs> she was she was apparently quite interested in mythology oh, at right. the time. Okay, so yeah. she was thinking about that. Yeah. Yeah. And of, and but you'd go for Pluto because so far all of the the major planets have been named for the Roman versions of their names of the gods. 
that's how what yeah. the astronomical convention now, was. Now, here's where it gets really slightly convoluted and interesting. All right. So the name Pluto itself, as you say, is Greek. Is Greek, mm -hmm. but it was adopted by the Romans. The Romans, mm -hmm. and in, in fact, I, I think was probably at least as common as some of the other. Oh, it was. Roman it was versions, the main. Right. It was the main name for the god in Roman mythology. Mm -hmm. The other name they use is Dis. Dis, dis yeah. or Dis, so dis Pater. Mm -hmm. So, which just means it's it's the equivalent of Eus Pater, Eus, the yeah. uh, Jupiter, um, is the god of the overworld. Dis Pater is the god of the underworld. But Pluto is certainly, by the time that they're writing about all the others, mm -hmm. becomes their most common name. It was never the most common name for the god of the underworld in Greek, though. In Greek, it was one of the epithets right. for Hades. Right. Hades was the name. The more common uh, that name. Was the, yeah. That was the sort of official name mm -hmm. of the god of the underworld was Hades. Idoneus. Now, Dis makes that wealth... Yeah, so aspect clear, because... and that's why I think they, as far as I know, and that would make sense, why they accepted why Pluto became once they knew, once they heard about that as the Greek one of the possible Greek names for the god of the underworld, why they chose Pluto and why that becomes the official or common Roman name is because of the pun on dis. Dis means wealthy, right? And Pluto, Plutos is wealthy in Greek, right? And so it made sense. It became then sort of the Greek equivalent, but then becomes the standard Roman name. Plutus. Now, do you know why Pluto, or what is it in Greek? Plutus. Pluton. Pluton, yeah. Why that root means? Well, there's, I, I mean, I looked a little bit of it up too. Do you have the quote from the Cratylus from Socrates? Because here we bring Socrates back in. Okay. Okay, so let me bring this in. So this is an actual ancient Greek etymologizing of the word. Okay. Okay. And then I'll I'll, I'll and, give the the proto Indo. Yeah, and then afterwards. you can you can talk about what what scholars now think, which I think is connected. I think it's relevant. He may be right. Yeah, he, I think he's not too far wrong. So in the Cratylus, which is, do you know that you you don't probably know this? This is an a dialogue I didn't even realize because as I said, not a Plato scholar. The Cratylus is a dialogue all about etymology. The entirety oh. of it is Socrates. Cratylus believes that etymology is truth. And so he's coming at it from this idea that like, if you can hmm. find out where the word comes from, it gives you some real understanding of the essence of the thing in the world. You know, that kind of fallacy, right? So does th this makes me think then, does Isidore of Seville know of this? I have no idea. I am so hopelessly knowledgeless about Isidore, Isidore is quite late. How, yeah. but, and, whether and, he would have known... But, but to, yeah, you'll have to look this all up. Because so I looked, I found this, and I was like, oh, I have to tell Mark. Oh, wait. No, I can't tell Mark. I have to wait for the wait. podcast. Okay. <laughs> so I didn't do any more extra research on it. But right. the Cratylus so, is all about etymology. I will point you to it. I'll okay. put a link in the show notes. And we'll have follow-up on this yeah. probably <laughs> Next in a future time. episode. And in it, Socrates, so Socrates doesn't really believe that etymology is truth in this, he, but he leads them through. But in the course of it, he gives all these etymologies for all these words and all these names. And there seems to be a whole lot of discussion about them because a lot of them are weird etymologies or stupid etymologies. And so the point is like, what is he trying to, is he trying to show that it's not true? Anyway, we'll have to think about that. But he says, he gives a whole set of etymologies of God's names. And for Pluto, he says, as for Pluto, he was so named as the giver of wealth. Plutos, because wealth comes up from below out of the earth. That's why, because wealth comes up from out of the earth. And Hades, I fancy most people think that this is the name of the invisible Iades, so they are afraid and call him Pluto. So he says, Hades is the name that means the invisible, but that's a scary name for a scary thing, so they use a euphemism. Right. They use a euphemism Pluto. And then he has a little dialogue about that, and then he uses it to convince that people... That he says that the reason he's called wealthy is not because wealth comes out of the earth, and that would mean both mineral wealth and fertility, too, like and, you know, plants and stuff. But no, it's not that. It's because all people want to go to the underworld because that's where real truth is. It's, it's a whole Socratic thing. And that this is the reason why no one has been willing to come away from that other world, not even the sirens, but they and all the others have been overcome by Pluto's enchantments. So beautiful as it appears are the words which Hades has the power to speak. And from this point of view, this god is a perfect sophist and a great benefactor of those in his realm. He who also bestows such great blessings upon us who are on earth. Such abundance surrounds him there below, and for this reason he is called Pluto. So this is, you know, a Socratic reimagining of the idea. He's called Pluto because of the wealth from the ground. Right. But really it's because he knows such wisdom that everyone who goes to the underworld doesn't want to come back. That's why no one ever comes back from the dead. And that's true wisdom and true wealth. 
right? Okay. Now that so that part is obviously just Socratic. Okay. But the part that he's saying that everybody thinks is that it comes from him being a giver of wealth. Interestingly, in Hesiod, the god Plutos is a god of wealth. Hesiod doesn't know, use the name Pluto to mean Hades. He right. uses Plutus as his own personification of wealth, just like this personification of everything. He's the son of Demeter because, again, wealth oh. comes from the ground. And I'm going to come back to that mm -hmm. point. And then the LSJ says, but I'll let you, like, the, so Little and Scott and Jones uh, talks about where that word probably comes from. Right. So I'll let you talk about that. But that's, the, I, I thought that was really interesting that we have this whole dialogue all about etymology, and I figured you would want to look into that. <laughs> <laughs> Cause, yes because there's a bunch presumably it's all strange folk etymologies as well as Socrates right. like manipulating etymologies sure. to make his points yeah. yeah I will definitely check that out but so we do have a very productive proto-indo-european root that lies behind Pluto Pleu yeah right. which has a lot of derivatives and a bunch of different uh, languages mm -hmm. so in Greek Pleo, pleo is to flow. To flow mm -hmm. and so the idea is overflowing right hence, abounding abounding hence wealthy Right. And indeed, we get the word flow right. from that, as well as fly, flood, flee, fledge, flight, um, fly, lots fly. of different words. Mm -hmm. So you mention this other well, figure, right? Mm -hmm. Plutus. Plutus. Or, it, yeah. yeah, Plutus, who is, yeah, maybe more specifically a god or a personification of wealth. Mm -hmm. um, in Hesiod, when I say in Hesiod, I mean in the Theogony, when he tells about the birth of all the gods, he mentions the right. god Plutus is born from Demeter. Right. And I guess the idea is that the two become essentially associated right. and combined, conflated. They become one, one. god yeah. who stands Pluto's for Pluto just things. becomes the epithet yeah. of yeah. Hades. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Which makes me wonder if, is it possible that the other Pluto comes from a different kind of source and mm -hmm. it's because the two names sound similar? Yeah, uh, this, these are hard conflated. to know because we don't have any, I mean, we just yeah. don't. Pluto as an epithet for Hades, for instance, does not turn up in Homer as far as I know. So it's a late, we don't have the earliest evidence. We don't have it in Homer. We have it in Hesiod, but only as the god mm -hmm. of wealth. Mm -hmm. We don't have it as an epithet for the underworld mm -hmm. until 5th century or so. So right. it's hard to trace then. Yeah. And the other thing is that, as you say, since the wealth is connected with the underworld mm -hmm. and this, this other mm -hmm. Plutos is also connected, you said, with Demeter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So maybe the stories are getting confused and that's another way that the two become... Yeah, and of course, yeah, because Demeter is associated with Pluto with through, through Persephone, through, through as we Persephone. just told that story. Yeah. yeah, so that's, I mean, there is an important and an under, a meaningful symbolic connection there about the idea of wealth coming from the earth. And right. Demeter, I mean, Demeter is the goddess. The Eleusinian mysteries, which were the great worship of Demeter, promised initiates wealth in this life and happiness in the afterlife. Well, at least they seem to have their mystery hence the name, but that connection is definitely there, mm -hmm. that there's this idea of abundance with fertility mm -hmm. goddess, and then somehow... But it's interesting because in other ways, Hades is very much a sterile god. Oh. So in mythology, Hades has almost no children. Right. Right? Hades and Persephone are a famous couple. But they don't have children. But they don't have children. Because death is the ultimate sterility. Sure. So in that sense, it makes... I mean, he's wealthy, but... And that's why I think by the Roman period... Pluto is seen as wealthy because of mineral wealth, because right. all of the metals and precious gems are stored in the earth. Right. And things that are buried with people are stored in the earth. Right. But not as an agricultural god. That link, right. if there ever was one in the Greek world, is not there in the Roman world. You know, if you look up his myths, the main one is the Pluto and Persephone. And beyond that, there's a couple of mentions of a possible child or two, maybe, but basically nothing. And given the male gods in the Greek world, they have kids. <laughs> Even the non-fertility gods, they all have kids and he doesn't. Now, while we're on the topic of the Roman tradition mm -hmm. and the conflation of different gods, we mm -hmm. talked about Dis as being another... Mm -hmm. um, the same god or, or same another god name, or yeah. an associated god. There's another Roman figure, Orcus. Mm -hmm. Have you heard right. of Orcus? Yes, Orcus, yeah, of course. It, very commonly used as the poetic name for the underworld. Right. So Horus uses Orcus a lot as the metonym for the underworld. So the shades of Orcus. Mm -hmm. Now Orcus, it's believed, may come through the Etruscans. Mm -hmm. Okay. The word Orcus seems to actually come from Greek. Mm -hmm. A lot of Etruscan stuff is linked to is Greek. Is linked to mm -hmm. Greek. So there's a Greek figure, Horcus. Okay. Horcus, who is a god of false oath. Because the oh, word okay. 
horkos is as a, a, as a word is means oath. Oath, yeah. yeah. So the god of false oath, as in the god who punishes those who swear <laughs> falsely. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Right. And he's mentioned in Hesiod, I believe. That would, yeah, I'm not surprised. Um, Probably in works and days where he talks a lot about people who break oaths. That's interesting because, of course, swearing by the rivers of the underworld was the oath that the gods could not break. Ah. So when the gods have to swear an oath, they swear by, I'm suddenly blanking, what is the river of the underworld? The river that Charon, we'll come back to him, has to cross. Not Lethe. Not Lethe. Not the other, not a, the, the, um, they swear by, oh, I can't remember. I have to look it up. Sticks? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Faster than my Googling. Yes, so the gods, when they want to swear an oath, swear by the river Styx, and it's unbreakable for the gods. Uh -huh. So that's who they swear by. So that's interesting that Orcus is tied to oaths and the those who break it. I don't know what it means, but it's interesting. So Horcus has then a later sort of etymological journey. It gives us the word ogre. Oh, really? Through French. Because of the underworld, not the oaths. Well, it seems to have just become a kind of like demon-like demon yeah, right. monstrous yeah. thing and becomes more of a sort of folklore -y right. figure that comes out of that when you get into sort of later, I guess, Christian mm -hmm. periods. Well, every, yeah, everything underworld then presumably just becomes demons for the Christians. Right. And there is an alternate suggestion, I believe, for the etymology. It, it was suggested that it might... I think this is now not believed. not believed, but that it might be from an early word for Hungarian. Oh, that ogre might be. That ogre might oh, come okay. from a word for Hungarian. Okay. But I think most etymologists now discount that that earlier theory, and it is connected with Orcus. Okay. The other word, of course, that we get from Orcus, the more obvious one, I suppose, is orc. Oh, right, of course. <laughs> and I think... So now we're going to get a connection to Tolkien. Mm -hmm. I think Tolkien gets... Well, I mean, Tolkien knew everything, of course. Yeah. So he, he, <laughs> he certainly knew... That's my basic assumption with him, yeah. yeah he certainly knew his, his classical mythology. Yeah. He certainly knew Orcus. And, and in fact, I think he specifically stuff. commented on the etymology of this word and why he used it. Okay. He had in his mind... Because it also comes into Old English. Oh, all right. So there is an orc... The reference to orcs, essentially, a slightly different form, in Beowulf, for instance. Right. And a number okay. of other... Sort and in glossaries and things. Yeah, basically to, it refers to a devil because there's... It, is it then the Cain stuff? Yes. Descendants the, the, of Cain? Or the, the descendants, uh, yeah, the, the various monstrous descendants of Cain. That include Grendel. Yes, yes that includes that's, Grendel. That's why that's yeah. brought up. And giants and so forth. So that's, I mean, he's he's probably specifically thinking of the Old English, but he certainly knew the, the Latin mm -hmm. word or Etruscan word, Orcus. The other interesting thing about Orcus, mm -hmm. this gets us back finally to, to Pluto, mm -hmm. is that, of course, Pluto was downgraded to a dwarf planet. It's no yes. longer considered a planet. And in fact, there is another dwarf planet mm -hmm. in the same category as Ceres? Pluto. No. Well, that too. And there Ceres. is an Orcus. <laughs> Oh, there's an Orcus. Oh, yeah. really? I think it's fun that Ceres is, given we were just discussing how Demeter is Demeter, connected to Pluto, yeah. since Ceres is the Roman name for Demeter. Demeter. Now, she's not, it's not anywhere near Pluto, but it's also yeah. another dwarf planet. So, yeah, 90482 Orcus, a dwarf planet considered, and it's one of these Kuiper Belt right. objects, right. in a specific category that's called a Plutino named As, after Pluto. Right. Things so that Pluto are Pluto-like -like objects. Yeah. Right. And it specifically implies something about its orbit in relation to Neptune. Okay. So essentially, Pluto and uh, Orcus are, are in doublets. the same kind of orbit, but they're, from what I understand, kind of in opposite arrangements, mm. so that Orcus is kind of an anti-Pluto. Oh, okay. They're never in the same part of their orbit at the same time because of the way that they resonate with and Neptune. Themselves with Neptune, right. Oh, okay. That is interesting. So the name was chosen specifically for that reason. Because it was twinned because with Pluto. Because it was Pluto. twinned with Pluto. Interesting. I didn't realize that the person who'd suggested it, the girl who suggested it, was particularly interested in, in mythology to that extent. Because the other thing about Pluto, as I said, there's almost no myths about it. Really, there's the story about how the Earth, that all of the world was divided into three. The, right. So he appears in that story where Jupiter or Zeus gets the heavens, they draw lots, and he gets the heavens, and Poseidon or Neptune gets the sea, and Pluto or Hades gets the underworld. He appears in that story, he appears in the Persephone story, and he appears obviously as the place people go for death, so he also appears in the Orpheus story. Right, as in where Orpheus goes to the underworld, There's and in a few other places underworld. where Heracles goes to right. the underworld, or you know, when people go to the underworld, yes, he gets they, meet, right. they meet him. 
But other than that, he was worshipped. But there's very so there were lots of you know there were shrines and there was worship and ritual. and ritual. But there was there's almost no myths about him. One of the thing few things that's said about him is that he is represented as isolated under the earth. Right. He doesn't hear, unlike all the other gods who live on Olympus and see things. They're not all seeing, but they they see what's happening in the world and they kind of take part in it. He was isolated. He couldn't see or hear anything on earth except when people swore by him or made prayers to him. So the only things he could hear were when people actually basically invoked him with their name. So I think that that's, again, really appropriate for Pluto, which is so far that we can't see it. And when you think about all this, you know, the, the time it's taking, the signals from the pictures to get to us and how isolated right. it is, it's the most isolated yeah. part of our solar system that we still consider the solar system, at least as far as we know, until maybe the probe will find something else beyond it. But at the moment... It's the one that is isolated, that only knows about us when we send a probe out to it, because nothing, you know, it's hardly even touched by the sun. So I do think it's really interesting how that works. Well, at least the Disney Hercules got that part of his character right then. That he only hears. <laughs> well, and that he's isolated. And... Yes, he's very isolated. He's a loner. That's yeah. true. <laughs> it's about the only thing that Disney Hercules got right about Hades. <laughs> and Pluto was never represented as having flames on his head, for instance. I've right. never seen that in the ancient sources. The other one I wanted to just mention was Charon, of course, which we're also getting lots of pictures right. of. And it's, I don't know if you looked it up, but it's interesting because Charon is named after, in association with Pluto, is named after the figure, the ferryman, who, who would ferry the souls of the dead across the river Styx. And his name comes from an adjective that means fierce or bright hmm. and is used Bright when it's re referring to eyes, and seems to mean sometimes bluish gray or gray. Ah. Euripides says his name comes from his fierce or bright eyes. Now again, that's Euripides, he's a playwright, he doesn't know anything about language. That's just a thing he says. But it's not impossible. But I wonder, and the source, I just looked in the dictionary, I didn't look beyond the, the Greek English lexicon, so I didn't look any further into it. But I wonder if it comes from gray or dirty appearance, like the idea that he'd be gray, right? Because hmm. the, the, he is always represented as squalid and dirty and an old, bent old man. Right. You know, he's not a, an attractive figure. He's the man you have to pay the coins to. That's why a corpse is buried with coin, coins on its eyes. So that's Charon. And so I think that that's an interesting pairing. Of course, it was given to the planet or to Charon when they thought it was a moon of Pluto, which it still sort of well, is. Well, it is a but moon now of the dwarf planet, but yeah, or, or they're, or they're dual. both their dual mm -hmm. planets. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the thing. But it's because of that association, just thought it was an interesting naming point to bring up. And gray or bluish gray certainly seems to describe the planet as we have it. It's true. <laughs> Charon doesn't appear to be any other color than that, yep. anyway. Sadly, we don't seem to have any other clear etymology for that name, it seems. No, it's a fairly isolated mm. term, even in Greek. It's not It's not a productive word. It doesn't have other forms. It doesn't seem to. Anyway, I just thought I'd mention that. So I think that's everything I had to say about Pluto. I don't know if you had any other to add. Oh, I know what else we wanted to talk about about Pluto. That article that I just sent you about from BuzzFeed. Oh, yes. About the names the other names of the of the features on pluto i don't have a lot to say about it but we i just this afternoon saw going around the proposed names or the sort of temporary names that are being used for the various features like craters and hills and mm -hmm. other features and on and... the surface of plato of plato of pluto, pluto even and Charon, and the naming conventions they're using and i just thought that was interesting we'll put a link to that uh, they're using for pluto Lots of references to infernal uh, yes. myth stuff from various mythologies. Yeah, so, so equivalent ideas. And they they had apparently stuff. they had apparently solicited names from the public in categories for it: space missions and spacecraft, scientists and engineers, historic explorers, and underworld locales, beings, and travelers. And they solicited names for that, and they're picking from those pools of suggested names for their various things as they find stuff that they need to be able to identify in their conversations. I thought that was interesting. So you can go, we'll put the link up and you can go and look at the various names, but there's lots of things to do with <laughs> underworld from not just classical myth. And that's the nice thing. Yeah. They've got some, some that are mythological. They've got Mayan and Inuit and African names for the underworld, but also things like Cthulhu yeah. and Morgoth. <laughs> 
<laughs> and Balrog. other <laughs> Balrog, things to do with uh, the underworld in fiction as well mm-hmm. as in real life. There's also a feature named after Lowell. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Lowell, because inventors so and, and or sort of scientists and yeah. And there's a crater named Bernie. Bernie Crater after Venetia Bernie, who yes. suggested the name. Yeah. And then Charon has its own naming convention. So they're using fictional explorers and travelers, fictional origins and destinations, fictional vessels, and exploration authors, directors, and artists. And that's where all the ones that are going to make the hearts of many nerds like us very happy. Lots of sci-fi references. Kirk and Sulu and Kubrick and Spock and And Gallifrey and TARDIS Tardis. and Ripley and Skywalker and Leia Organa, Vader... All of these names are on there. Nemo. And I saw some comments because, of course, I was stupid and read a few comments on the BuzzFeed article before I remembered that you don't do that. I saw a couple of comments saying, I can't believe these stupid names are now on the solar system. And what made me laugh about that is, oh, yes, because Pluto is such a real thing. And <laughs> Jupiter <laughs> and Vulcan. Oh, those are real things as opposed mm-hmm. to our fictional Sulu and Kirk. Mm-hmm. No, the mythological names for them are just as made up. They come out of a certain heritage, sure. But I don't see any reason we can't have Spock on Charon. And why there's any reason that we can't have modern fictional stuff as well as right. old fictional stuff. <laughs> They're just names, people. Getting back to, to some of the Pluto ones, mm-hmm. and in terms of sort of literary reference, mm-hmm. there is pandemonium. Yes. Pandemo- pandemonium which is dorsa, which is a Milton. word coined by Milton, reflecting pantheon, all yes. the gods. So pandemon. Pan, all the, all of all the, the devils. The demons, yes. So a, a, an underworld reference. And also, if you look a little closely, there are two sort of trenches, mm-hmm. which are called fossa, Yes. Related to yeah, because all fossil. the names for the types of features, all, all the names for the features are in Latin, in Latin so words. regio and yeah. fossa and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Fossa related to the word fossil. Oh, yes, I right. <laughs> Which you have a video about. Video <laughs> but there's a Virgil fossa and Beatrice fossa. And that, of course, is Dante in Dante. the underworld, right? No, I think it's lovely. I mean, the, the reason I even saw this article was because it was, it was tweeted by a classicist friend saying... Oh, you know, classicists and nerds alike are going to love these names. Right. And it is. They're just, they're wonderful. They're, I think they're a great range of things. And why on earth not? All right. I think that wraps up Pluto. What do you think? Yeah. I think I we've said think as much as we have to, to contribute to it. That's what I've got. <laughs> All right. The one other thing I wanted to do before we finish is to say thank you to someone. Speaking of Tolkien... There's another podcast that I listen to. One of the people on it is an old Twitter friend of ours, Jonathan Cox. The podcast is called Talking Tolkien. And they, at the end of their last episode that I listened to, uh, mentioned this podcast as having just started and suggested that people come and listen to it, which I really appreciate. And I wanted to say thank you very much for doing so. Thanks. <laughs> and I also wanted to return the favor because I genuinely think it's totally something that people who might be interested in this might be interested in, if you like Tolkien. Because Absolutely. what they're doing is going through the works of Tolkien, reading the books, and talking about them chapter by chapter. It's Jonathan, Katie, and Chase. I don't remember their last names, sorry. And they went through the whole Silmarillion. Now they're working their way through The Hobbit. By the time this goes up, they'll probably be moving on to The Lord of the Rings. I assume that's where they're going after The Hobbit. And I've just found it really interesting. I've read these books before, some of them a long time ago. The Silmarillion I read once at the cottage and didn't understand at all. <laughs> and, and, but I've, I haven't reread them as they've been talking about them, but I've been enjoying having them talk about the details in the books and talk about the mythology and their reactions to it. They are all at different levels of Tolkien mania. <laughs> Katie is a diehard Tolkien expert who was raised on it, literally, by her mother, who's an academic who's written on The Hobbit. And Jonathan has read them all, or read a lot of them, and enjoyed them, but is not particularly, doesn't consider himself an expert, I think. Sorry, John, if you do. And Chase is hasn't read very much of it and is reading them for the first time. So they're kind That's of having... an interesting balance. Yeah, yeah, so they're having a little discussion. Anyway, I just think it's an, a fun podcast, so check that out if you have a moment. And if you're interested in either revisiting some of those books or reading or hearing about them for the first time, you don't even need to have read it, frankly. If you don't want to have to read Tolkien, but want to know all about the books, you can just listen to their <laughs> podcast and you'll get the gist of it. So thanks to you guys, and I look forward to more of your episodes in the future.
All right. Well, I'm finished my drink. Yeah. Pretty Me much too. gone. Mm -hmm. All the pomegranates are gone. I'm going to have to go back to the underworld for the winter, I guess. For the moment, though, we can enjoy the summer. It's very hot here right now. So I think we should wrap it up. All right. So thanks for listening, and we'll be back soon. For more information, check out the website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits. We've also got all the ways you can follow us, Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, G+, a mailing list, and Instagram. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avon Sarah, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at Alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on iTunes or to the feed on the website. And please review it on iTunes if you can and if you've enjoyed it, because it helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye. Come in. I can. I'm holding. <laughs> oh, okay. I'll come and help you. I'll come. I'll help you. All right. You need me to get your mango juice? I want to open it. Okay. I will risk it. I will risk it. Mommy. I will risk it. Mommy. Yeah, no. I feel like big squid is actually one of oh, the things that's about a tampy. Uh, Okay, I'm, I'm doing something right now, sweetie. <laughs>